Every Muslim is a Sita. Sita is the one who was abducted and who had to be liberated. So that's what happened in Indian history. Many Hindus were abducted, that is to say, were put under duress, sometimes even, you know, with a, you know, a dagger Sorry. to their throats, but usually in the form of social pressure, and so converted to Islam under those circumstances. The human beings who have converted to Islam or to Christianity, if they come back, you see, they will bring their mosques with them and make them temples again. Namaste to all the Sangam Talks viewers. Welcome to today's session. Today we are here with Dr. Conrad Els. We are here to discuss a subject which is very close to every Bhartiya. Today's discussion is going to be centered around Ayodhya and Ram Janmabhoomi. Dr. Elst has written five books which are about Ayodhya and he has dedicated a substantial amount of his time in researching about the Ayodhya and Ram Janmabhoomi. My first question for today is about your book only. Before we come to your book, I want to understand how did you discover the Ayodhya controversy and how did you get, get interested in it? Well, I was in uh, India for the first time in autumn 1988. And just at that time, the uh, Satanic Verses affair erupted with the ban on Salma Rushdie's uh, novel, The Satanic Verses, in um, that period, you know, was uh, ordered by Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi at the request of the Muslim uh, leader, Syed Shahabuddin. And um, I read a strange polemic in several newspapers, especially in the communist fortnightly uh, frontline, where a number of hardline secularists, especially the communists, strongly opposed this ban. They thought it was a uh, concession to religious obscurantism. And on the other hand, more moderate secularists, like from the Congress Party, and so at that time, especially Khushwan Singh and MJ Akbar, who later became a BJP ideologue, but so was then with the Congress Party, they supported the ban. They found some specious reasons why. Freedom of speech does not demand that this book be published and so on. And so I thought this was very interesting. In, in the West at that time, I would have thought that secularism meant supporting uh, criticism of religion. And so that certainly not uh, justifies such a ban. But so in India, it seemed that secularism was not exactly what we thought secularism was. Now, in informing myself about this, uh, the backgrounds of this debate, I noticed that the, the Ruzdi affair was actually rooted in the Ayodhya affair. It was because Sayyid Shahabuddin had announced a Muslim march on Ayodhya to coincide with the Hindu festival there, that um, Rajiv Gandhi calculated, you see, this is going to be a bloodbath. I want to avert it, and a price I am willing to pay is to ban this book. So that's how uh, my attention to the Ayodhya affair was drawn. My uh, first article about it was just after the uh, death sentence issued by Ayatollah Khomeini against Salma Rushdie on the 14th of February 1989. So in the first days of March, my article in the communist Flemish fortnightly Toestanden, Toestanden means situations, 
so that appeared there. And so in that article I explained, and so that was a new thing, I called the attention by explaining that the Rusdi affair that then everybody was talking about was in fact rooted in this Ayodhya affair. And so that's how uh, it all started for me. Uh, how did the idea came to you about writing a book on it? The Ran Jan Bhumi versus Babri Masjid, which you wrote in 1990. Yeah, well, it had to do with my uh, first meeting with uh, Sita Ram Goel, which was in late 1989. And so I had already visited the, the RSS uh, headquarters, John De Wallan. Um, headquarters in Delhi, I mean, their national headquarters are in Nagpur. But, um, yeah, it, it, you know, I didn't think it important enough until then. But so I visited Sitaramgol and then I started understanding the communal situation in India. And so then I, I remember, you know, we were talking about the uh, the face of the communal debate in India at that time, namely the Ayodhya affair. And so I was quite uh, enthusiastic about it. So when I left, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to write about it. And, you know, in a few months, you know, you'll hear about it. And so he told me afterwards that, you know, inwardly he smiled and thought nothing will come of this. But so, to his surprise, I did write a book about it. Now, it's not a particularly important book. It's uh, essentially a journalistic book that just describes, you know, what the, the fuss was all about, gives the arguments that were doing the rounds at that time, and uh, concluded that, you know, clearly there had really been a temple there. And so the mosque standing there was really the fruit of a purposeful temple destruction. And so that um, earned me a lot of sympathy in Hindu circles, which was important because at that time, the Hindu movement still had this culture of secrecy, of secretiveness, and um, they greatly distrusted outsiders and especially Westerners. It also had to do with the original culture that the founder, Dr. Hedgewar, came from. So for a while he had been part of the Bengal revolutionary movement. And that movement, you know, operated in strict secrecy. They never uh, created documents to send to each other because documents can fall into the ha hands of the police. So it was all oral communication. They actually had to travel to go communicate with someone. And uh, so Het Gevar had that mentality. And so that initially conditioned the functioning of the RSS. And so that, that was part of the, the movement's you know, organizational culture. And so for me, suddenly the whole thing changed because I, had, I suddenly had access to them. You see, when I look back on it, it's so funny. All the books written by Indologists about the Hindu movement were based on, well, something else than direct contact, you know, which was very limited to them. And for me, suddenly all the doors went open. You know, I even could sit in on a few policy-making meetings that they had and so on. And so I got to know lots of uh, things that then I used for the next work, which was a PhD thesis about the political Hindu movement, that, you see, through no special merit of my own, was full of new information. And um, so I earned my PhD thesis with that. That became my book, uh, Decolonizing the Hindu Mind. But at any rate, that is all the fruit of this initial Ayodhya book I wrote. So I, I don't think that that book itself has any special 
value is certainly is completely outdated now, but um, it played a major role for me. Also, in India, it was noticed because the uh, opposition leader at the time, L.K. Adwani, presented it in a press conference, which was presided over by Girilal Jain, the ex-editor of the um, Times of India. And um, so the book was not, 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 not special, but special about the book was that here was a, suddenly a Westerner who said publicly that the Hindu side is right. You know, they claimed that there was a temple, but effectively there really was a temple. And whereas most Western Indologists were then safely in the pocket of the eminent historians, you see, of those in India who denied that there had been a temple there. And so to draw attention to that, he gave this press conference where, you know, he held up this book. Uh, fortunately, he ha also held up a more important book, namely the one by Sitaram Goel called uh, Hindu Temples, What Happened to Them, which contained this list of uh, nearly 2,000 temples that had forcibly made way for mosques. So that was, a, I think, more important message. Uh, the, the true story of the uh, history of the Ram Zalmabhumi, of course, deserved to be told, but it was more important to emphasize that this was part of a larger behavior pattern resulting from the Islamic theology of iconoclasm. And so there was not just one controversial temple in that case, but thousands. Anyway, so uh, that photograph landed on the front page of most newspapers. So uh, it's rather more than I deserved, but suddenly I was fairly well known in India. So after Ram Jan Bhumi vs. Bafri Majjit in 1990, uh, your next book, which is titled as Ayodhya and After, somebody might interpret that it is on Ayodhya from the title. But it is not really on Ayodhya, or is it? Well, it puts the Ayodhya affair in a larger context of the, the situation of Hinduism in India, which was at the time badly on the defensive. And so it sketches a number of uh, problems, you know, the, the constitutional discrimination against Hinduism, the political practice, uh, the reputation of Hinduism, which was going down, 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 down. So it's in that larger context. There are a few chapters that are also about the Ayodhya affair. But so, I mean, that's all, you know, more than 30 years ago. That's not very topical anymore. Uh, but it was, for me, an interesting exercise in really getting to know the complexities of the communal situation in India. Afterwards, in January 1991, government organized a scholars' debate to understand the issue of yes. Ayodhya and Ram Jan Bhumi. Well, I think you were part of a, that debate. Am I right? Well, yes and no. I was okay. not part of the team of scholars deputed by the Vishwa Hindu Parishad to defend the pro-temple case. Um, however, I have been on some of their meetings and... Later on, you see, after the debate, when all the uh, pieces of evidence, documentary evidence mostly, uh, had become available, uh, the VHP asked Sitaram Goel to, you know, edit it together in, in book form, which then Sitaram Goel entrusted to me. So I wrote the narrative stringing all these pieces of evidence together. That became the book um, History versus Casual History. My name is not mentioned in it. So clearly you were linked with Sita Ramji and LK Advani ji as well. So somehow, uh, anyhow, were you involved in the street agitations which took place between 1989 to 92? No, absolutely not. Um, 
the only connection I had with it was uh, after the shooting of the Karsevax uh, by uh, the Chief Minister Mulayam Singh Yadav, where the Kothari, Kothari brothers Kothari. had been killed. I visited the Kothari family in Kolkata. And so, uh, of course, I saw the, the pride that they displayed in the heroic martyrdom of their sons. But what struck me more was the grief that it had produced. And so, I really wondered, you know, was this necessary? Could this not have been avoided? Wasn't there a more clever strategy possible that would have avoided these dramatic events? So at that time, I didn't know of any. Today, you say, having studied the affair more closely, I think it was possible. Because the then ruling party, the Congress party, well, Center. ruling in the 1980s, um, and then again effectively ruling under Chandra Shekhar, that was a minority government in 1991, uh, that was totally dependent on Congress support, and then again ruling under Narasingh Rao from 1991 on, onwards. So that Congress party was not against the temple. And uh, so they were more or less working towards the temple uh, in a, you know, practical fashion. And with practical, I mean, you know, the usual Congress dealings of, you know, what you call horse trading. Uh, in this case, you see, giving some sweeteners to the Muslim leadership so that in exchange they could give the temple site to the Hindus. And that could have worked, uh, but um, two things came in between. One was that the BJP like drew the issue towards itself with the Palampur resolution in 1989. Uh, although still, you see, if Congress had played it right, it would not have been the property of the BJP. It would still have been a more or less national endeavor to get this temple rebuilt. But the other thing was the um, statement of the eminent historians in 1989, the political abuse of history, which cleared the pitch completely, which totally radicalized the issue. And so they made the Babri Masjid into the Mecca of secularism, into something that every, you know, rational being had to defend against the forces of darkness, meaning Hindu Tva. And so from then on, for Congress politicians, it became risky. You know, they didn't want to be seen as Hindu fanatics or anything. They just wanted some practical arrangement. And so, you know, if the, it had depended on them, no blood need to have been, to have flown. You know, for them it was just a little affair. It wasn't such a national crisis that the eminent historians and their media allies made it into. And so, you see, looking back, I am convinced that the Kothari brothers need not have died. But so, you know, at that time, that was what I saw, um, you know, that in, in, in this affair, clearly the uh, Karsevaks were defending something that ought to be defended. Although, looking back, I would say that it could have been defended, it could have been achieved in a more non-violent manner. So it took you almost nine, ten years after that to write another book about Ayodhya. Uh, from the title, it seems like that you uh, suddenly took a stand against the temple in 2001 when you wrote the case against the temple. Yeah. So, is that a dis deceptive impression? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it put the readers on the wrong foot, I suppose. 
because many people who saw the uh, front page of the book must have thought, ah, this is a, you know, a, a book against uh, the temple, which it was not. You see, it drew attention to the case against the temple. Namely, until then, everybody knew that there was a case for the temple, which, of course, the media tried to portray as spurious and a Hindu concoction and so on. But nevertheless, they knew that there existed arguments in favor of the temple. Now, there were no arguments against the temple. You see... Some of the eminent historians have told me afterwards, yeah, but we didn't need to give arguments because we didn't claim anything had happened. They claimed that there had been a temple demolition and, you know, um, Islamic campaign of iconoclasm and so on. We said it was not there. And you can't prove a negative. You don't have to prove a negative. That's not entirely true because... At any rate, something happened. You see, this, this masjid was not produced, like, automatically. So, if there was no temple demolition, what may have happened, for example, on some sunny afternoon, you see, Babar takes his horse out for a ride, and he sees this beautiful piece of forest, and he thinks, wow, this would be a nice land to build a mosque on. And so he finds out, you know, who the owner of this piece of land is. And he buys it, he draws up a sales contract. You see, this piece of forest is sold to Mr. Babar for so many rupees, you know, with the purpose of building a mosque on it. Now... That would have been proof that there had not been a temple there. Unfortunately for the people who believe there was no temple there, such a document has not been found. This is still possible. You see, suppose that this document, you know, landed in some courthouse, which innocently, you know, was burned down because of a you know, lightning struck or something. Uh, and then maybe, you know, that document had disappeared. Okay, maybe. But the more important thing is that no attempt was made to find this document. Is there no historian who has said, yeah, I've been looking for this document, but unfortunately it had disappeared. No, nobody has been looking for this document or for any other proof for some innocent scenario. Why not? Well, the, the secularists were so confident, they didn't think they needed to prove anything. You see, they thought, ah, we are the party of rationality, of science, of modernity, and they are a superstitious bunch. We don't have to take them into account. Well, they were mistaken, and they should have known by then because you know, the other side was bringing up all this evidence, evidence that they knew, you know, I mean, when they were sitting in a jury for some thesis by a student or so, they knew, you know, which was real evidence, which was not real evidence. So I, here they had to admit that, yes, the other side is uh, presenting evidence. And no, you see, they, they managed to just uh, not see that, and so they remain comfortable in their position that, you know, we don't need to present evidence. So, you see, my title drew attention to the fact that there ought to have been a case against the temple, but there is no. So, your book in it highlighted that there was no case against the temple that the party had. Yeah, and meanwhile, it uh, presented a lot more evidence uh, in favor of the temple. It also put this in the larger context, the Islamic doctrine of iconoclasm, and addressed a new line of argument on the other side. You see, the eminent historians in the limelight, they, as long as they could, kept on 
uh, championing the idea that there had not been a temple there. But in the background, you see other people in their camp saw that they were losing the argument. And they prepared the next line of defense. And that's what you now find in most school books, you see. A, a pure denial of Islamic iconoclasm that is no longer tenable. So the next line of defense is, first of all, to greatly downplay it as much as they can, to minimize it. But then to blame the Hindus for it. And so that is still very much in the school books. You see, after 10 years of BJP rule, that's absolutely being taught to children in India today. Namely, that, well, it was the Middle Ages. Of course, there were temple destructions. Now, that's not true. In ancient Rome, for example, or in ancient India, there were no temple destructions. That was even older than the Middle Ages. You know, it's not because of the Middle Ages that there were temple destructions. No, in the Middle Ages, much of the world was divided between Christianity and Islam, and they practiced temple destructions. Or, you know, the forced conversion of temples into churches or mosques. And so Hinduism even then was not to blame for this. Secondly, an American self-described Marxist historian, Richard Eaton, came up with an idea that then has been taken over by the Indian secularists. Because, of course, this you have to give them. If one person comes up with an argument that is useful to the secularist case, immediately all secularists will take it over. That's a big contrast with the Hindu performance in debate, which is not very effective. Uh, anyway, so his case is that there are uh, temple demolitions on the Hindu or more generally on the pagan side, you know, and they have been attested rather well in the case of Mesopotamia. There are a few cases in India. Of course, the textbooks magnify this as if these few cases, you know, counterbalance the thousands of cases on the Islamic side. Moreover, they are not the same thing. You see, when Mahmoud Ghaznavi destroyed the Somnath temple, he made sure that the idols in the temple were thoroughly destroyed. You see, he took, <laughs> he had them smashed, and the pieces he took with him to mason into mosques, you know, into the floor so that the Muslims had the pleasure of treading pagan idols underfoot. Destroyed after being disrespected. Yes, of course. So he destroyed them. He didn't worship them. Now, there are a few cases where uh, pagans did something to idols. And I'm going to explain what. Now, let's first start outside India. Because, of course, it is, it is a, uh, an important argumentative trick of the secularists to confine uh, the, um, the attention of the listeners to just India. By you know, doing uh, what? Uh, as if this, for instance, this problem of Islamic iconoclasm has an Indian reason, which then becomes a Hindu reason. No, of course, you see, it was an existing practice that existed outside India in the preceding centuries. Now here also, let's start with this pagan uh, temple. Uh, well, it's not temple destruction. Um, so they, they weren't concerned with the temples, which is really just the house in which an idol lives. But they were concerned with the idols. Now, Muslim temple destroyers, they first of all destroyed the idols. The temples that depended, sometimes the temples were reworked into mosques. And so also the, the building itself was not important, it's the idols that were important. Now, they destroyed the idols. By contrast, what happened on the pagan side? 
they abduct idols. And so that's also some, a certain form of violence, but they don't destroy the idols. And they replace it in a temple. Near yeah, to their you see, place. what happened was that, you know, you won a war, and given the importance that people attach to idols, you want to make a show of your victory by taking the idol from the loser and taking it home and installing it in your own main temple. And so, yes, there are a few such cases in India where someone took a Shiva idol, took it to his own temple. So, what exactly happened? In the temple of the loser, the Shiva idol disappears. So, what does he do? Well, he pays a craftsman, an artist, uh, to make a new idol, and he pays a priest to, you know, do the consecration of the idol. Yeah. And so you have a new idol, which is being worshipped by the same people. You know, it is the same God that is being worshipped. Meanwhile, the winner takes the idol to his own temple, where again he has his priest consecrate the idol, and so the worship of the idol continues, now not in that place, but in that place. And so the religion is not affected at all. The only thing that changed hands is a material object, the idol, nothing else. Now, by contrast, when the Muslims deal with these idols, they destroy them. Because after all, it's not so much the temples, it is a little bit more the idols, but it's ultimately not just the idols that they want to destroy. They want to destroy the religion of the loser. So in this case, they want to destroy the Hindu religion. And so these Hindu idols, you know, are instrumental in the larger project of destroying the Hindu religion. By contrast, these Hindu kings who abducted idols, they of course were not destroying their own religion. That's a big difference. Uh, moreover, Richard Eaton claims that the Muslim kings did what they did because Hindu kings had done the same thing. First of all, it's not the same thing. But also, whatever Muslim kings did was not because Hindu kings had done anything. There is absolutely no case, and he himself has completely failed to produce even one, where a Muslim king says, okay, I'm destroying these idols because I'm following the example of this Hindu king. No. You see, whenever they want to justify what they're doing, they are quoting the example of Muhammad or of earlier Islamic iconoclasts. But the ultimate justification is what Muhammad did in the Kaaba. In the Kaaba, there were 360 idols, according to Islamic description. And Muhammad, as soon as he conquered his original birthplace, Mecca, as soon as he uh, entered it, he went to destroy these idols with his own hands. So the existing religious pluralism, because every cult was represented, all the idols of all the different cults of all the different sects were represented. So this pluralism, he destroyed. That was his life's work. You had a successful multicultural society in Arabia. His life's work was to abolish that multicultural society. Multicultural, or what in India they usually call secular. So, after this, around in 2002 and 2003, court ordered excavation. Yeah. At that time, in 2003, you came up with a booklet named Ayodhya, the finale. Anything that you might want to discuss from that? Yes, well, that again was not a very important book. So the earlier one, Hinduism, the case against the temple, that I am very proud of. I think that that is a good book that made a very important contribution to the whole debate. This one, not so important, is also based on the press reports at the time about the excavations. Of course, the, the media are, you know, to be well distrusted as a source of information. 
But anyway, you see what information was available at the time. I think I, I showed that it again, you know, added another type of proof that there had indeed been a temple there. So as you know, the um, Uttar Pradesh High Court uh, had decided to look into the evidence. So they looked into the documentary evidence, which they found was all on the side of the temple. But they said, okay, well, you know, documents, you know, anyone can write anything. Uh, let's find out materially what was there. And so at that time, the mosque was gone. You know, the, the ground was flat, and so they could, you know, it was open for excavations. So they organized excavations quite professionally by the Archaeological Survey of India. They made sure that there was a good proportion of Muslims among the excavators. They did not want to be accused of, you know, partisan manipulations. One of them, K.K. Mohammed, has later also presented to the larger audience the findings. So he very much supports the temple. I mean, there are still, there are still uh, attempts by some secularists to claim that this was all manipulated and Muslims were kept out and is a you know, Hindu concoction and so on. No, <laughs> we have personal eyewitnesses and participants in the excavation who can testify that they really found what is on display. Uh, so they found the basis of the temple and they found many, you know, remains of the temple. In fact, there are four moments when archaeological discoveries were made. One is in the 70s when Bibi Lal, the greatest Indian archaeologist, excavated there. So he already found outside the mosque, you know, the, the basis of a temple that was much larger than the mosque. And um, then Indira Gandhi, the prime minister, explicitly prohibited him from making this public. And that's, that remains a constant. You see, the secularists are always against, sec, uh, you know, scientific excavations. They always try to, you know, somehow prevent actual evidence from seeing the light of day. Then you have the demolition in 1991, when, you know, they were just trying to demolish the mosque, but offhand they found a lot of temple evidence. You know, some in, in, in the ground, you know, when they took the, the stones to take them home. Uh, but also within the walls. I mean, of most buildings, you have an outer wall and an inner wall and an empty space between. And so in that empty space, they found quite a few temple objects that apparently the masons had put in there, had hidden there. Uh, one of those was a big inscription that says in so many words that here an incarnation of Vishnu um, who, you know, fought against Ravana with the help of the monkey god and so on. I mean, it's, it's about Rama. And uh, so there have been attempts by the secularist side to pretend that this was stolen from a museum and brought there and so on. This all turned out to be false. So this inscription was really there. Many, you know, statues and so on have also been found. So that's the second time, 1992. Then in 2003, you had the full excavations where a lot was found, including the foundations of the temple going all through, you know, beneath what used to be the Babri Masjid. And then when they started to build a new temple in 2019. You see, when a building company builds anything, the first thing they do is to dig a very big hole. And so there they found even more temple objects, you know, that they hadn't been looking for, you know, they were just there. Okay, so um, 
So this is more or less the story that I tell in that little booklet. So it's it's nothing new. Many people have have told it, and so if you want to read a more complete uh, account, I'd say that a book written ten years later by Minakshi Jain uh, is uh, more complete on this. Right in 2010, the UP High Court gave its verdict. And I think few months later, sometime in 2011, you presented a paper at Saint Petersburg's Oriental Conference, mm -hmm. and it was titled "The Three Ayodhya Debates." What are those three debates, according to you? Uh, this was this was read in 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 front of an audience of people who were, let's say, sufficiently trained to understand the issue, but who usually didn't know the issue. So I explained from the ground up that actually there are three debates concerning Ayodhya. One is about ancient history. Was Rama really born there? So the, um, the excavations show human habitation till the mid second millennium BC. Now, at the time, you see, we weren't sure about his date because we weren't sure when Rama lived. Now, this is, a, this is the first part of the first question. Did Rama exist? And so, here you have the Puranic king lists. You know, I, I really dislike it when Hindus rely on the Puranas for reconstructing their history because the Puranas are meant to be historical but contain a lot of fanciful stuff and so you have to sift you have to use all your skill as a historian to sift you know genuine from exaggeration from complete fantasy um, nevertheless a very good part of the puranas is the king lists and so these king lists are extremely important in writing history you could never have written the history of Egypt or of Mesopotamia without using their king lists. In India, for some reason, Western scholarship has decided, oh yeah, but these Hindus are not to be relied you know, on, the, you know, that's so fanciful. Well, that's not the case. And so you see when you compare different versions of the king lists or you know, the later part where the king lists can be checked against actual known history and writings, you can see that these king lists are pretty good. And the special thing about them is that compared to the um, Egyptian and Mesopotamian lists, they go back much before the time of writing. You see, Egyptian king lists, I mean, their writing starts in maybe 3300 BC. Their king lists go back a few generations farther. And by contrast, in India, king lists go back to, and here I quote a figure cited by the Greek uh, ambassadors after Alexander the Great came, or Alexander of Macedon, let's not be biased. Uh, okay, so, um, so there were Greeks in and near India and they reported that in India they used uh, king lists going back to what can be calculated as 6776 BC. BC. Uh, so that, that's quite impressive and so when you try to give a reasonable length to the reign of each king. You know, when you go back to Manu, supposed founder, the, the patriarch, I mean, he was already a distant ancestor in the time of the Veda. Then that's a realistic estimate. So, you know, these king lists are not to be trifled with. I mean, they're, they're a very serious source of information. Now, they're Rama figures. Uh, his um, capital, I thought in the beginning, must have been the capital of the solar dynasty, to the Ikshvaku dynasty to which Rama belonged. Uh, that's not entirely the case in the sense that 
they moved their city several times. That city where Rama was born was built only by his grandfather, Aja. So if Rama lived in the second millennium BC, you know, that literary tradition may very well correspond with the archaeological findings, which go back to more or less that time. So what did you have before Aja? Well, another city, clearly also called Ayodhya. Uh, but you see, cities at that time were often, you know, were built on the side of rivers, but the risk was that they got flooded. And so sometimes people rebuilt their city, sometimes they moved. And, but they took the name with them, especially in this case, because the name Ayodhya was very meaningful, it means unconquerable. And so, you know, this is how they wanted to project their, the power of their dynasty. Um, and so, interestingly for archaeologists, it remains a challenge to now go and find the earlier capital city where, you know, the earlier solar kings lived, where Manu lived, you know, interesting. So, the, I mean, the, the search is not over yet. But so the search for Ayodhya, that is complete. The, the Ayodhya where Rama was born. So that's for, you know, ancient uh, Indian history. Uh, we also come to, and this is where I can again quote uh, Minakshi Jain. We come to the worship of Rama respectively also of Krishna. She's also written a book about Mathura. Uh, and you can see that they were worshipped already before Christ. I mean, there has been an attempt by the secularist historians to say that Rama worship is only late medieval. No, it's much older. And so at some point you get buildings on that same site that clearly are no longer human habitation, that have a public function, namely religious. Then we come to the second question, what happened in the Middle Ages? So there was a temple building at the site in the 11th century that disappeared. Now in 1030, Salar Masud Ghaznavi, the nephew of Mahmud Ghaznavi, conquered this area. Not for long, because three years later he was defeated by a Hindu alliance with uh, Raja uh, Suhaldev and featuring also Raja Bhoja, the famous philosopher king. The, the, the Muslim invader problem was uh, solved suddenly. And so they could start rebuilding their temple. I mean, the Ghaznavis were famous for temple demolition. This temple disappeared. Now here we have no writing, no document about it. Here we simply connect the dots. You see, Islamic conquest, temple, temple disappeared. disappeared. Is there a connection? Well, Seems judging like by the Islamic writers, yes, there was a connection. Now, then a large temple was rebuilt, it was a Rajput dynasty, so they, they always speak about the Rajput temple. And um, so they built it really in style. They said, okay, our temple has been destroyed, now let's, you know, rebuild it and make it better than it was. So that is the temple of which the foundations have been found by Bibi Lal and uh, KK Muhammad and so on. That temple was also destroyed. Now, when did that happen? So here we are busy with our second question, what happened in the Middle Ages? Now, this is the difficult point. And here I am in uh, debate with the other historians. You see, the, the Vishwa Hindu Parishat case, supported by many historians, is that that temple is the one destroyed by Babar. Now, Sayyid Shahabuddin, the Muslim leader at the time, said this is impossible. At least if your story is true, you claim that Muslim kings practice temple demolition, then how come Muhammad Ghori and his uh, lieutenants conquered the area in 1192-94? then founded the Delhi Sultanate 
1206 to 1525, actually established a provincial capital in Ayodhya. So there was a, a, a garrison there. And you see, all these powerful Muslims were looking at a big Hindu temple after they had demolished all Hindu temples all the way to Bengal. You see the Nalanda University, all the temples in Benares, and so they destroyed them all. And yet, strangely, they would leave this big idol temple intact. And even in Ayodhya, they destroyed, you see, the, there were five giant temples for five tier Tankaras. There were Buddhist establishments, there were all kinds of uh, idol, you know, idol worship. So, and they destroyed many of these temples. And so this Rama temple, they would have left standing. So Syed Shahabuddin, he may be of the opposite party, but nevertheless, here he was right. He says, you see, that that is not logical. Either there was an Islamic doctrine of iconoclasm, and the temple was destroyed in 1194 by Shah Zuran Ghori, who took that part of the conquest, or the temple survived all through the Sultanate period, but in that case it's not true that Islamic conquerors practiced iconoclasm. So I agree with him and I say, yes, that big Rajput temple was destroyed in 1194. And it was no longer standing when Babar came there in 1526. Yet there is a tradition, uh, like in the inscriptions on the gate in front of the Babri Masjid, that said that uh, it is under Babar, his, uh, his uh, commander Mir Baki, uh, that the temple, or that the mosque was built, rather. Now, what exactly happened? Well, here, I have to confess, as a responsible historian, we don't know. You see, we have indications that the Islamic presence was established or re-established on the site. We have evidence that there was a Hindu temple there. We have evidence, we have plenty of evidence, that Hindus kept coming back to the site as close as they could. I've visited Ayodhya last year once before when the Mahabari Masjid was still standing. But now I visited it, and interestingly, um, quite close to the temple site, um, there are houses with little temples inside. So, you see, this is what Hindus did at a time when there was an Islamic presence at the site. They wanted to keep coming back to the site as close as they could. So they built little John Mastan temples inside the houses as close as possible. I mean, you know, this is one show of Hindu devotion. So they kept celebrating Ram Navami, you know, the birthday of Rama, as close as possible to his birthplace. And we find testimonies by foreign travelers where they say, yes, you see, there was a, you know, a big festival of Hindus on that side. They don't mention Muslims. They also usually don't mention a mosque. Now, what was the situation at the time? There was a period of chaos when the Mughals conquered India at the expense of the Lodis, who were the earlier Sultanate uh, dynasty. So I speculate, and here I can't do more, we, we don't have documents about it, I speculate that Hindus reoccupied the site and that it is that Hindu presence that Babar destroyed again. Now, what was the Hindu presence? Well, it may have been something that existed after the demolition, that they had a tent or some temporary structure housing the idols, or they may have used an existing mosque as a temple, which is exactly what happened between 1949 
when Hindus installed the idols in the ex-mosque, the disused mosque, which was only used till 1936, when, because of riots, the British closed the building. So between 1949 and 1992, there was a mosque building standing, which was used as a Hindu temple. Now, I think that that existed also in 1526. Now, to further complicate matters, and, and here I emphasize, you see, if you want to do cheap, you know, cheap history with all simple fairy-like uh, storylines, then you won't be satisfied with this. But if you look at reality, you see, this is the thing that may have happened. Several historians and, and you know, art historians in both camps, you know, both in the temple camp and in the anti-temple camp, have said, actually, if you study this, the, the mosque as it was, it is typical sultanate architecture. It existed before Babar. Uh, so they say, you know, it was built in 1300 or so. And so Hindus were used to the presence of this mosque. And when they got the chance to reoccupy the site, well, they didn't immediately go all the way, demolishing the mosque, rebuilding a temple and so on. It was all, you know, wartime and, you know, they did what they could. So they left the mosque standing and they installed Hindu idols in it, just like they had done in 1949. And it is that Hindu presence that was again destroyed by Baba. Which may, and this is further to complicate matters, which may have been re-established under Akbar. Because Akbar, in the later part of his reign, and first he was a jihadi, a ghazi, like all the rest of them. Later on he became more uh, magnanimous and tolerant. So he allowed many temples to be rebuilt, like the Somna temple that Ghaznavi had destroyed, and the, 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 the Krishna temple in Mathura and so on. He allowed this to, to be rebuilt. Now, what happened at the time in Ayodhya? We do not exactly know. We know from uh, William Finch in 1508 or so, in 1608, that uh, there was a Hindu presence at the site, that Hindus you know, had their festivals there, and he doesn't mention any riots with Muslims or so. So, you know, little Muslim presence is attested there, so it's quite possible, and here I emphasize possible, I, I'm not sure of it, that Hindus could comfortably use this place for their celebrations. Now, later, you know, there are different wars and you know, uh, Mughals and, uh, you know, there's Aurangzeb who re-establishes Muslim presence, who again destroys uh, all the temples. And by the way, there is a testimony by the Austrian Jesuit father Tiefenthaler in 1767, who attributes the demolition of a temple that must have existed to Aurangzeb rather than to Babar. But then you can say, yeah, but at that time, everybody still more or less remembered Aurangzeb and all temple destructions were automatically attributed to him. You know, I, again, you know, this is a complex matter and historians still have work to do on it. But at any rate, there was a Hindu presence at the site which seems to disappear by the time of the British. So for a while, the Awad area, the Ayodhya area, is a more or less independent uh, Muslim regime. Then the British get influence there, then finally they take it over formally. Uh, at any rate, at the end of this mid-19th uh, century, it's a practicing mosque with Muslims going there every Friday. And the Hindus are kept out. You know, outside they have a presence with a you know, a crib and, a, you know, an altar. But the mosque is off limits to them. That's for the Muslims. Then you get a trial where the local Muslims, the local Hindus, and the British judge 
are in total agreement about the history of the site. Yes, of course, there was a Hindu temple there, which had to make way for a mosque. But, says the judge in his verdict, since that happened 300 something years ago, it's rather late to do anything about it. So he, in his verdict, chose the status quo. Hindus were not very satisfied with it, which is why later on there were riots, and so then the British authorities closed the building. That was in 1936. So the Middle Ages, stretching them until 1936, uh, have a checkered history, certainly marked by at least two Islamic temple demolitions. Or maybe three. Maybe three. We don't know exactly what or how much of Hindu presence was destroyed by Baba. And it's not that there was no documentary evidence. There should have been, and there should have been excellent documentary evidence, namely the diary of Baba. He kept the diary. And so many events in his life, we have his own version his own explanation of why he did what he did. Here we don't. Not because he hasn't written it, but because it has disappeared. And so he describes in a later part of his diary that a storm wind had taken the pages of that period. So the evidence is gone, and we are left to argue among historians about what happened. So that's the second question. Then the third question is what to do with it today. Now here, we have the history. We know that there were temple demolitions. And so Rajiv Gandhi and his, the next Congress Prime Minister Narasimha Rao stated explicitly that the choice whether to build a temple should depend on the evidence of whether a temple had pre-existed which was a polite way of saying, I want a temple, because everybody knew what the eminent historians were hotly denying, but everybody knew, of course, there was a temple there. But, you see, our side won the history debate. You see, the eminent historians and all their hangers-on in the media and in Western Indology departments were defeated fair and square. Nevertheless, Rather than enjoying, oh, yeah, we won the debate, you know, we should recognize that actually these decisions should not depend on a history debate. You could say, and the secularists could have said, but because they were so drunk with their power position, they didn't say it. They said that there had never been a temple there. Instead, they could have said, like the British judge in 1886, let bygones be bygones. They could have said, yes, of course there was a temple demolition, but that's no reason to start tinkering with the whole thing now. They could have said that. Instead, they took the more ambitious position, no, we're going to deny the history. There was no temple demolition. But conversely, you could also say, well, you know, whatever happened in the past, let's look at the present. Ayodhya is a sacred site for Hindus. Hindus go on pilgrimage there. They have been going on pilgrimage there even in the worst of times when it was violently occupied by uh, another religion. They still kept going there as close as possible. And today you see they go there in millions. Now, isn't it logical that a Hindu place of pilgrimage is managed by Hindus? Is, is adorned with architecture that Hindus choose. I think that is perfectly logical. And indeed, that's how it is done everywhere by every secular government. In, in Israel, you know, the government doesn't believe that Mohammed went on a winged horse to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in, uh, in Jerusalem. They don't believe any of this, but it's an existing religious belief and so they accept it and they regulate this, uh, they facilitate the pilgrimage there. 
In France, you see Lourdes is a Catholic pilgrimage site where supposedly the Virgin Mary appeared to some schoolgirl. And um, so the, the, the militantly secularist French governments that, you know, existed uh, since about 1870, for most of the time till today, they laughed at this. They didn't believe any of it. And yet, they, they facilitated the pilgrimage there because, you know, fellow human beings who are just as respectable as you and me, they believe in it, they want to go on pilgrimage there, so okay, let them. So it is very, very, very obvious that this site belongs to the Hindus. And so, you know, it's been fun for us as historians, it's been very interesting, very entertaining to conduct this history debate. Nevertheless, it's not really important for the decision about what to do with the site today. And so the site today belongs to the Hindus. So ideally, government should have intervened long ago and allowed Hindus to worship there. Is that what a right thing to do would have been at that time? Yeah, that's a good question. Should the government intervene? Uh, you know, we're now so used to the whole idea of going through the courts and so on. Actually, if the government had intervened, what it would have done would have been just. It would have been right to award the site to the Hindus. Uh, whether procedurally it is defensible in this kind of political system, that's another question. Um, but then, in the case of the Indian government, which pro, you know, intervenes a lot in religious affairs, for example, by drawing to itself the management of Hindu temples, this, you know, ought to be part of that policy. You know, so in, in the particular Indian case, I would say it is in keeping with existing political practice to fairly and justly allot this place to its Hindu claimants. That would have saved those years, long years of battle in Supreme Court. Yes, of course, and of course. Courts. After that, in 2013 and 2017 as well, two books on Ayodhya were written by Minakshi Jainji and you reviewed them in detail. So, what new information did they have for you? Because you have been linked with that subject for such a long time. So, what new information yes, did well, they have? Um, one element is that um, she describes in detail all the Ram worship that already existed long before these demolitions. The same thing with the Krishna worship in Mathura. Um, so, you know, this to me like widened my horizon considerably uh, because me too, I was a little bit influenced by the claim of the secularist historians that this only starts with, you know, the Ramanandi sadhus in the late Middle Ages and no, 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 it was, it was a lot earlier. So to get the right perspective, it's good to know that. And the second thing is that it describes in detail the conduct of the court proceedings, proceedings uh, in Uttar Pradesh, where especially noteworthy is the fate of the uh, eminent historians. You see, when the judges found that all the documentary evidence goes in favor of the temple, how come that these prestigious uh, history academics have said the opposite? You know, they didn't present any evidence for their case, but they made a claim that there had not been a temple there. And so they were called to the witness stand. Please yeah. explain yourself. And they couldn't come up with anything. They stammered, you know, that, yeah, of course, there's no evidence. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist. I've never them... been to Ayodhya. Uh, you know, I only signed because everybody else signed, which is true. 
You see, he, had, he was speaking the truth. That's exactly what they did. Some of them didn't even turn up and send their assistants. It was a very uh, poor performance. And, you know, from a human perspective, I wonder why they didn't prepare themselves better. You know, they could have thought up some story, you know, that would, of course, not prove the non-existence of a temple, but at least that saved their own face. You know, they could have said, yes, but at the time it seemed that the evidence was this way, and therefore, you know, I mean, they could have saved their own face. Even that they didn't do, you see, they, you know, apparently their mind had stood still since 1990 when they had been going high and mighty that no, no, there was never a temple there. And that story had remained in their minds and so they were totally unprepared when the judge asked critical questions. Anyway, so the end result is that, you know, that collapsed completely. And so most of the historians who were involved at that time are now looking the other way, are simply not, you know, using these arguments anymore. It's only outsiders, you know, who still try to claim that this was false history and so on. Uh, like I, I just read a, a, an article from last year in... Uh, was it the wire or was it caravan? Anyway, both are the same in this respect. That claims that, uh, oh yeah, it was the obituary of Bibi Lal, where, you know, you would expect when you announce somebody's death, you would pay some respect to him. You would emphasize the good things or the things that you think good and leave the criticism for some later, you know, occasion. Someone no, you see here, the leftist historians, this is how they are. They went, you know, full, you know, on the attack against Vivilal, even in his obituary. And so uh, they wrote that, you know, he was proven wrong with his communal stance in the Ayodhya case. This is in 2022, when, when all the facts about Ayodhya were long well known, were out in the open. So they still think they can get away with their lies, which is partly true, because they still have the media in their pocket as regards reporting about India. You see, I mean, there are very few people who know about India. If today in the West some claim is made about China or about Arabia, there are enough experts who can modify that about India, you know, everything is still in their hands. And, you know, I have to say that, that the present supposedly Hindu nationalist dispensation is not effectively doing anything about this. Like, for instance, when Modi earlier this year was attacked in a BBC documentary, you know, all, all the BJP government could come up with was the idea of banning this documentary, which, first of all, is completely ineffective in the age of the Internet, and which, anyway, is, uh, you know, is a very negative move. I mean, Hinduism traditionally is not against free speech. You know, the, the anti-free speech law in India, 295A of the Penal Code, was enacted to protect Islam against criticism. And of course, formally, it protected all religions, but the occasion was to protect Islam against criticism in 1927. And, and so, you know, outsiders will claim, oh yeah, this is how Hindu extremists they are. They even want to censor some BBC documentary. No, they have never moved a finger to protect Hinduism against criticism. Here it is Modi who was attacked. And so they wanted to protect Modi against criticism. Which anyway is futile because Modi is attacked in the media all the time, everywhere. You know, so it, it was, you know, it showed their political incompetence really. Uh, but anyway, um, the point is, they do not have a strategy to remedy 
the existing so-called Hindu phobia uh, that still uh, sets the tone in the world media. The leftist narrative. Yeah. I sometimes wonder what is their motivation still. I I can imagine in ni- before 1947, mm. they wanted to rule a set of people, which was Indian subcontinent. Mm-hmm. They wanted to subjugate them. They mm. wanted them not to be proud of their roots, their heritage, their culture. Mm-hmm. That was a big motivation for them to downplay everything. But what is the current generation's motivation to uh, still be stuck in that narrative and not give the due credit which this civilization clearly deserves? Well, the main reason is simply inertia. You see, they've heard that narrative, a narrative which became ever stronger since Mm -hmm. independence. Mm-hmm. And so you had a erosion of Hindu feeling among the Hindu masses. Who were more and more, you know, watching TV and so on, getting more and more Westernized. Americanized. And uh, so that's that's the main factor, I think. It's not some conspiracy or so. This is just this is how people are. You know, they are influenced by what is in their surroundings. A second part is, of course, that nothing is being done against it. You know, partly, partly it's a, a conscious strategy, like the, the missionaries, for example. They can't afford to openly use their school system uh, to convert people. You know, that would, after a while, create conflict. What they do do is to estrange their pupils from Hinduism to make Hinduism seem funny, to teach them little about Hinduism, to make them forget about Hindu festivals, or to put Hindu festivals in a negative light. You know, like there's so much pollution, but suddenly the firecrackers on Diwali are a a threat to the climate or something. There are so many animals being killed on Bakar Eid, and yet the few birds that die because of the uh, kites that Hindus fly on Makar Sankranti, they suddenly are the problem, and so on. I mean, there are many ways of creating anti-Hindu narratives that seem innocent, that seem motivated by some some global concern, when in fact they are meant to just estrange Hindus from Hinduism in order to make them more susceptible to conversion to Christianity or Islam. So that part is not so innocent, but a lot of it is innocent. Inertia. No, I mean, yeah, is inertia and is, uh, you know, you could say in Bollywood, for example, there are subtle messages that are injected in films where you see the bad guy is always a Brahmin and the savior is a Christian and so on. Uh, But, you know, you have many other cultural influences. And so nowadays with the internet, uh, the younger generation is far more personally in touch with Western, you know, music and films and so on. These are not made purposely to influence Hindus. Yet they have the effect of, well, opening them up to another world, another um, landscape of thought, uh, which makes them less familiar with their own Hindu culture. And so, you know, which makes them less concerned with Hindu culture. Like, for example, since we're talking about Ayodhya, um, I myself have seen in 1990, 92, what an enormous enthusiasm there was among the Hindu youth about Ayodhya issues. I am not sure you will see the same thing today. You will see the same thing on a sufficient scale to make, you know, sensational footage about it. But I think some total, it will be much less than 35 years ago. And so you know, that, that, that is happening. Um, I don't know if building a temple will make much difference. I mean, this 
you know, the, the, the opening of the temple that's about to happen uh, is a moment of joy and of a certain self-satisfaction. Like, look, you see, they wanted to deny this to us and we pulled it off. Uh, so that, that's, that's fine, but, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's a limited effect. You know, it, it will only produce something if it is part of a larger, you know, raising Hindu consciousness. And so that takes a lot more than a building here or there. You know, that, that takes a rethinking of the education system especially. Before we come back to Ayodhya, one more question about this. Is this some, in some way an extension of uh, that iconoclasm and missionary work that was being done by both, both Christianity and Islam, I would say? Yeah. So is this in some form an extension of that? You see, Christianity, for example, doesn't destroy temples of other religions anymore. Yes. Islam less so, although, you know, in Bangladesh and so on, it, it's less systematic, but it still happens regularly. Uh, but, I mean, you can promote one religion without that all too physical, all too visible uh, procedure of temple demolition. So and and so the fact that not just the secularists, but also the Muslims themselves have been trying to deny the temple demolition is in a way a good sign. Of course, it was mendacious. It was untrue to what really happened in history. At the same time, it showed an eagerness to be seen as tolerant, as pluralistic, and so on, which is good in itself. It's a very step forward. One yes. Step forward. But so it is, it is still possible to defend, to advocate the interests of Islam or of Christianity without temple demolitions. And so then you have to face a subtler problem. Uh, so that doesn't end all conflict. But at any rate, I think um, in the modern age, this thing should not be tolerated anymore. Uh, I do not advocate absolutely uh, demanding every temple back. I mean, if you have a few symbolic ones, a few important ones where not the temple, but the site itself is important, like the birthplace site, you can't move that elsewhere. Agreed. Um, then um, that, that should be enough. For the rest, I do want all these uh, Hindu temple sites to become Hindu again, but only if that which really matters, namely the human material, the human beings who have converted to Islam or to Christianity, if they come back. You see, they will bring their mosques with them and make them temples again. But so, I mean, I don't think it's worth it to start more Ayodhya affairs uh, concerning all these other temples. Next question is about 2019 Supreme Court verdict. The final verdict came in 2019, essentially confirming the UP High Court verdict and thus allotting the contentious side to the Hindus. I know your answer to some extent, but still I will ask, was that a correct decision according to you? Well, yes, I mean, it's a Hindu side, of course. It deserved to be awarded to the Hindu side, absolutely. Uh, so, yes, that was a correct decision. Whether it was a correct decision to allot another plot of land at some distance to the Muslims to construct a mosque, you know, they stole the land, but okay, you see, in practical politics, give them that, that land for their mosque. So I'm not, not really against that. So that was, uh, on the whole, a correct decision. Now, of course, you can read more closely what does the verdict say. So the, the High Court verdict said very explicitly that they accept the evidence. Two of the three judges also except that there is a connection between the building of the mosque and the earlier demolition of the temple. One of the three judges, a Muslim, denied that. He said, yes, you see, there, there was a temple there, a mosque was built, 
but it's not necessarily connected. It's not that the temple was demolished in order to build a mosque. And strictly speaking, you see, when you see the history, uh, probably there was, you know, decades between the demolition of the temple and the building of the mosque. So you could argue, yeah, maybe there was no immediate relation. Not in this case. I mean, in hundreds of cases, yes, there was such a relation. In this case, I'd leave it open until maybe one day we have more evidence. So at any rate, whatever the history there, it is totally correct that the site now belongs to Hindus. And so in, in that respect, the Supreme Court, even though it underbuilt its decision differently than the High Court had done, the, the final conclusion is the right one, that no doubt. May I also um, say something about the earlier question that I now think of? Um, I've said it before, but I think in this present context it is worth saying it again. So I said before that Every Muslim is a Sita. Sita is the one who was abducted and who had to be liberated. So that's what happened in Indian history. Many Hindus were abducted, that is to say, were put under duress, sometimes even, you know, with a, you know, a dagger to Sorry. their throats, but usually in the form of social pressure and so converted to Islam under those circumstances. And so the Muslims you are now facing, except for a very tiny minority directly descended from Arab or Turkic invaders, mostly, you see, they are the people who were the victims of Islamic conquest. So that should sort of nuance your attitude towards uh, Muslims. At any rate, they did not ask to become Muslims. They did not premeditate this. I mean, there is a version in Indian history started by the Communist Party founder, M. N. Roy, that the masses were waiting for Islam to come, that Islam had a liberating message. Now, this is all, this is another fairy tale. But so, you see, the circumstances that made the Indian Muslim community are rather complex. And so, uh, I'd have some, you know, human fellow feeling here. And so, what should be done ultimately with the Muslim community is nothing. Um, you leave the initiative to them. Nevertheless, because of the scientific temper that the Constitution recommends, you know, you provide them with all the relevant information, which now more and more is becoming available and also far more easily accessible. You know, you have YouTube videos, it's just, just one mouse click and you get all the information. Um, so make that available to them and they will outgrow their, their belief system. Um, you see this already on a pretty large scale. Uh, in most Western countries now, you have a society of ex-Muslims. The same thing in Kerala. In Arab countries, you have the same phenomenon, but not that formalized. For that is still a bit Under too dangerous. Party. But so there are scientific uh, opinion polls conducted every 10 years among the Arab population that shows that the adherence to Islam is systematically lessening, declining. Uh, so just let that happen. And um, the problem will resolve itself in. in you see that the difference between Islam, Christianity on the one hand and Hinduism on the other is that the scientific revolution leads to serious doubts about the defining dogmas of Christianity and Islam. 
Whereas in Hinduism, yes, there is, a, there is some dead wood that will fall by the wayside. Like, uh, for example, there is a common belief in the, uh, the four yugas, the four world ages that imply that uh, Rama lived about 900,000 years earlier than Krishna, which means he lived like a million years ago. And earlier avatars, that many million years earlier. Now that's nonsense. Uh, and that's based on easily identifiable, you know, calculation error. That would lead us too far, that's for another occasion. Really? But so those beliefs, you know, are going to be given up sometime soon. But that's okay. You see, the Vedic Rishis didn't have those beliefs. You can perfectly be a Hindu without those beliefs. So in Hinduism, what will fall by the wayside are some, some extra things, you know, some some embellishments, but the core of the Hindu tradition will remain. So my next question is about your latest book, which is released this year only. I suppose it is your final book on Ayodhya affair. It is titled as Forever Ayodhya. It contains all your papers on the controversy after the High Court verdict of 2010, or let's call it the Hindu victory. What new additions have you made to this book? Much of it is what we have discussed, like it contains um, my reviews of Meenakshi Jain's book, it contains this paper, the three Ayodhya debates. Um, what I've worked out in more detail is the case against uh, Richard Eaton's cop-out okay. of saying it's the Hindus are to blame. So that's in more detail. I, I of course, document uh, how much ground this explanation has gained. You see, both in India and in the West, this is now systematically propagated. You know, very many people of the younger generation don't know any better than this. Uh, so it's, it's quite important to refute that. Then there are a few uh, discussions of parallel cases. Like, for example, in Tamil Nadu, a um, temple has been found with a statue, strange statue, deformed. And it turns out that this is actually a Buddha statue, which has some typical traits of the Buddha, like long earlobes and so on. And so that was found in a field a bit broken, and so it has been pieced together, that's why it looks funny. But, you know, Hindus who found this did what they typically do. They started worshipping it. I mean, this is a very common phenomenon, like a friend of mine um, was involved in some excavations in Bastar, which is a tribal region, central India. So they had hired some local porters to carry their weight and so on. So then they started digging and they found some murti, some, you know, idol. And immediately their tribal employees set this up and started worshipping it. Puja for, you know, a statue that they just found there. So this is also what happened there in Tamil Nadu. They find this statue, they immediately start worshipping it. Now, you see, some art historians and so on decide, oh yeah, this must have been a Buddha statue. And so some local neo-Buddhist, you know, some Ambedkarite Buddhist, goes to court and says, Hindus must be forbidden from worshipping this. This is a Buddha statue. Now, first of all, Hindus do worship many Buddha statues in India, in Southeast Asia. It's also against the Places of Worship Act. Remember in 1991, Nara Singha Rao tried to justify his effective steps towards the Hindu temple in Ayodhya by prohibiting any similar cases to emerge. And so for that you have the Places of Worship Act, so the status of religious sites should not be altered from what they were in 1947. So overruling this law 
the court says, okay, we're going to interfere in the case of this temple. Okay, this temple has to be closed unless it is a Buddhist temple. Um, so I analyze this thing and I, I, you know, find that, you know, Buddhist temples don't have the history that the Ayodhya temple has. Indeed, it is Buddhist temples themselves who were demolished the by the Islamic invaders on the same footing as the Ayodhya temple. And so you have the famous case of Nalanda University and so on. Uh, or of the Bamiyan Buddhas, you know, before they were actually dynamited in 2001. They had already been rendered you know, non-functional uh, many centuries before. So, you see, this didn't deserve that treatment. Anyway, so that, that, that case is still evolving. We're going to see how it ends. But so this is something worth documenting to better understand the whole landscape of which the Ayodhya affair is a part. Then there are discussions about recent developments concerning Ayodhya. Like, for example, the first stone was laid on the 5th of August 2021, which is the second anniversary of a great moment in Narendra Modi's career, namely the abolition of Article 370 that gave a special status to Kashmir. So Kashmir has been normalized. It has the same status as all the other states in India. Now that was a daring thing and Modi had promised that and finally he had done it. So that's nice. But to celebrate its second anniversary, I don't know. I mean, you know, first we would want to see some, some results on the ground rather than just a, a law text that has been changed. But especially the Ayodhya affair is something else. It deserves to be uh, given a treatment that is appropriate to it. And so to be reduced to an instrument for a celebration of this Kashmir affair it's not, uh, not very proper. And then, now, so far so good. You know, it can be any date as far as I'm concerned. However, uh, it turned out that Hindu astrologers, you see, not the kind of people that I usually go to for decisions, but nevertheless, they decided this is a bad time. And so the reason turns out to be, if I understood correctly, that the moon was waning on that day. You see, this is a rule that goes back long before the Hellenistic, you know, scholars brought in the horoscopy that originated in Babylon. And so the, the Yavana, Jataka and so on, the, the, the birth system of the Greeks, literally, uh, those books and so on all date from the Christian age. They're fairly recent by Hindu standards. But you see, a rule that goes back to the Vedas is that, you know, if you want to start an undertaking, like the first stone of a building, you have to start under the waxing moon. Because, you see, the moon that grows symbolizes an undertaking that prospers. Now, I don't know, you know, maybe this rule can be tested, you know, you can compare 100 enterprises started under the waxing moon with 100 started under the waning moon. I don't know what the result is going to be. But, you see, if, if Hindu dharmacharyas have that rule, then shouldn't you respect that rule in a religious occasion par excellence? So... You know, here, I think that the BJP was typically very insensitive to religious concerns. You see, this, is a, this criticism is voiced by Hindu traditionalists, but occasionally, when they hear of it, also by the secularists, you know, saying that, yeah, well, the, the BJP is an Americanized lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and so on, who aren't really in touch with Hinduism. And so there is something to that. 
you know, they, they want to bring in tourism rather than pilgrimage. You know, they have created some plaza around the Kashi Vishwanath in Varanasi, demolishing actual Hindu temples to make it more tourist friendly. Same thing in Ujjain. So, you see, it's that logic that operates here. You know, there are external, mundane, secular reasons for choosing this date, overruling, you know, the Hindu tradition uh, concerning this. Uh, so, it's not, I will not leave any sleep over it, but strictly speaking, it is significant for some culture war that is going on within the Hindu community. You know, traditionalists against, you know, well, what shall I say, BJP secularists.